James, welcome to our podcast, and uh, it's really good to meet up with you again. We get to talk every now and then, but um, consider this a way for a lot of other people to get to know you. So um, let's talk just a little bit first about your background. Some years ago, probably I think more than 20 years ago, you were working as a consultant. You've been a principal architect, principal consultant, and had some engagements as a CTO, helping other companies and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I'd love to. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, yeah, when I, when I started off my career, I came in at the tail end of the client server era as we were starting to transition into web consulting web development. And so I worked at a consulting company that helped uh, get uh, startups off the ground. Uh, we did a lot of enterprise work, but we also worked with smaller organizations that were funded and, and were looking for a way to get their product out the door. So I, I started there, spent quite a bit of time doing that and founding a couple of products along the way, and then eventually stumbled into this opportunity to be a VCTO, a virtual CTO for startups. So I leveraged my development architecture background as well as my product thinking background and turn that into an opportunity to help other startups get started. Much like what I did at the start of my career, uh, it circled back again and I did that for quite a while before embarking on where I'm at now in, in an API consulting role. So your company is Launch Any, and um, I know that you've you know, especially before COVID had engagements in Europe. I think our trips overlapped a few times, but we never met up and you do quite a bit of work in the U.S. Can you tell us just in, in general, um, the kinds of work that you do now? Sure. Yeah. I, so that's true. I, I've done a lot of uh, a travel over the years, delivering workshops and uh, consulting and coaching engagements uh, that I'll speak to uh, primarily in Europe, a little bit in Asia. And uh, but but most of my work tends to be focused here in North America. Um, what I do is I work with uh, uh, different organizations, typically enterprise IT, but sometimes a software service company as well, where we help them to establish, grow and mature their API program. So what that means is we sit down and, and take an assessment of where they're currently at in their API journey and then identify gaps and areas of improvement and map that out for them and either leave them with that and they kind of continue on with whatever teams they have in place to execute on that or we'll engage uh, in what I would call a shoulder to shoulder kind of engagement where we're there kind of rolling up our sleeves and helping teams to uh, understand how to design APIs and helping centers for excellence or centers for enablement to put in place the processes that they need to to really mature their their engagement and scale it across the organization. And when you say we, you don't mean you and your cat. You, you actually have a team of consultants. I do, yes. So I tend to be the primary lead and I, I see myself as an owner operator. I still really love to get in and help organizations out. And then I have a, a network of, of API consultants that I bring in as well that deliver some of the training, help with uh, API design coaching and other elements of the engagement. So when you walk into an engagement, do you ever find that your clients kind of need to level set with some kind of training initially, sort of some, some background information about where you're headed? Or do you just dive in and start um, designing APIs? Most of the engagements start with that level set and training in mind. There's an element of understanding where they're at and meeting the organizations where they're at. So doing an assessment up front is really helpful to better understand where they're currently at in their journey. Some have a more mature process. They've been doing APIs for quite a number of years, just under different technology umbrellas. And so they've migrated their processes over already. Others are almost starting brand new because they've had a different focus over the years. And so doing an, a, an initial assessment and understanding where everyone's at is really important. And then once we do that, we determine, you know, what level of training is going to be needed, what level of, of introduction of processes are going to be needed as well. Okay. So uh, for the audience, if you hear a, a cat, James actually does have a cat who likes his attention, maybe more even than his clients. I don't know, or different kind of attention, right? Yeah. Maybe he wants to play instead of. <laughs> definitely more demanding. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you go into a company, what kinds of problems do you see in businesses today or challenges? You know, the kinds of things that uh, no doubt are somewhat similar, but probably different too than your past 20 years or so in, in software. 
years ago when we first started engaging, it was oftentimes a particular team, one particular team or a smaller organization that was looking for some assistance in designing an API. They really saw their problem as we just want to design a great API, make sure that the documentation is top notch and, and be able to have a great developer experience overall. And so our engagements were fairly confined to maybe one particular team within a large organization or a, a small to mid-sized software as a service organization that was you know just starting to come to market with a product offering or maybe doing a, a second revision of their product and wanted to add automation support through an API. But now we really see a lot of organizations that are in different parts of their journey. And the biggest question we get asked is how do you scale an API design process? How do you make it effective? How do you deliver an effective developer experience when you have so many teams working in parallel? You know, software has really started to, to take over a lot of organizations, whether they're software or not, that old adage of, of software is eating the world. And so a lot of organizations are embarking on this journey, perhaps for the first time, at least in a formal way. So we see a lot of, of questions come up about how do I equip my staff, whether they're developers, product owners, you know, whatever role they're in, how do I equip them to be effective at API design? Um, how do I scale this across the organization? And then how do we create a repeatable process so that any part of the organization can design and deliver an API effectively? So we, we engage in a number of different ways as a result of that. But those are the oftentimes the conversations that we have initially. Yeah, I find the same today as well in, in our work. It's interesting when someone says scale right away, you know, you might think scaling agile. Do you find it pretty challenging just trying to understand yourself how scaling can work for each organization? It is. And, and that's part of that initial engagement. We spend a good amount of time understanding how the organization operates today. There'll be different titles, as we know, for the various roles in an organization. The structure will be different. The culture will be different. I've worked across a number of different business verticals from uh, hotel, hospitality industry to commercial insurance, banking, NGOs, and, and others. And each one of them, they organize in a different way and they have different goals. So their goals for scaling will vary as well because they may have, some may have a, a dozen or so delivery teams building software. Others I've worked with, they have 2,500 plus individual delivery teams that are cross-functional in nature. And so scale means different things to different people. Some organizations as well, they will organize themselves around maybe a, a particular group of people that are responsible for the API. Other organizations will spread the responsibility of API design and delivery across the organization and empower teams all over to be able to be involved. And so the level of scale that we talk about will vary, but the, the general underlying principle is the same, which is how do we create a consistent developer experience across multiple APIs that are either productized and delivered externally outside the organization or delivered internally within the organization to speed up delivery of internal developers and, and the work that they have to do. And sometimes it's a combination of those. So understanding that scale is part of that and initial engagement and try to understand, you know, what, what do they envision as their target architecture or their target state? How many teams are involved with API design and development? And then how do we get to the point where they're equipped to be able to do it and empowered to be able to do it, which are two important factors when we talk initially with them. Right. And what I find too is, you know, software is eating the world, but these days, most organizations want microservices to eat the big ball of mud monoliths. And how does that go for you? Do, do you run into a lot of uh, legacy COBOL systems running on big iron, so to speak? Uh, we do see that, particularly in some industries that that have had you know mainframes around for for a number of years, or they have been around for you know 100 plus years. They have legacy systems that speak. Um, you know, they they may have mainframes in place. They may have different elements at, at play. So there's definitely that side of things. Uh, there's also a lot of organizations that are already on their microservice journey, and that microservice journey looks different for everyone. Uh, but they, they've begun that process and they're trying to figure that out and how APIs play a role in that as well. So it, it's a pretty broad spectrum. It, I, I find it really fascinating when I can get into an organization and they have mainframes that they're trying to eventually retire. They have client server apps written in Delphi, written in Java, whatever it is that have been around for a while because they've been in business long enough and they can't just let those things go immediately. And then they have serverless solutions as well. So they have services that are deployed 
uh, using a function as service or, or that style of, of deployment model. And, and they, they span, you know, a lot of those different spectrums and you have to kind of make sense of all of it by digging into their business processes and understanding what they're really trying to achieve and then start to look at how each of these systems play a role and start to figure out where APIs can then come in and help to drive automation around all of that. So once you understand better the scale involved and the needs of the organization, maybe the perspective shifts somewhat and you're now focusing on, at you know, I'm not saying immediately, but at some point you're focusing on how to make developer experience what it needs to be when you're working on designing an API, you can't only think of what you would like to serve, but what your clients want and what their needs are. How, how do you design an API for people maybe that you can't even talk to? Yeah, this is, this is really important. Um, first off, it, it, it means taking an outside in approach to the way we design things. So when we can work with those that are going to be using the API, that's really an important factor, spending time understanding what they're trying to do. But we also leverage uh, Clayton Christensen's job to be done framework to really put ourselves in that mindset of how to design an API. And, and it's kind of funny because the jobs to be done comes from that voice of the customer that was very popular in the 80s. It's putting your head in the mindset of those that are going to be using the software or whatever solution you're building. And, and the jobs to be done approach is really focused or has gained a lot of popularity from the product thinking or product design perspective. So it's what am I bringing to market as a product to solve a particular problem? So what's the trigger, the problem situation? What's the job to be done and what's the resulting outcome? Uh, when we take that perspective and really leverage that for APIs, we allow ourselves to disconnect from what is today and allow ourselves to have kind of an, a, a do-over moment. Uh, an ultimate do-over moment for some organizations where they get to step back and reassess what they're doing, what value they deliver, what their business capabilities are that they're delivering to the marketplace, and also how they want to automate that or make that digitally interactive in some way. And so we can step back from that and start to think, what are the, what are the problems that need to be solved? What jobs are required to solve those problems? And what's the final outcome as a result? And when we put ourselves in that mindset, our APIs take a different shape. They no longer necessarily reflect the way we do things today or the way that our software is organized today, the way our databases exist, the way we've modeled data inside those databases and so on and so forth. But rather we take a, an outside in perspective and we start thinking about what kind of outcomes are we delivering? And then how do we design an API to meet those needs step by step to achieve those outcomes. And it, and it allows us whether, you know, in an ideal situation, we're able to interview the end users or the developers that are going to be using this API. But even if we can't, we can always apply this process as best as possible to what outcomes are we trying to deliver. And it gets us out of that mindset of thinking about features and about just the the details of JSON payloads and uh, or XML schemas or you know whatever world we live in, and really to think about how do we address the human problem first, and then make that an API that can lend itself to automation or integration into different digital channels. And I think too, um, you said something very interesting there, which we now hear much more often, and that's product. So treating an API as a product or making it a product, how does that differ from say past efforts? And I, I think you've already touched on some of that, but if you could focus more on the product side of it, what, what does that mean to your team? Yeah, the, to, to extend that idea a little bit, when we think about a product, we don't think about just a, a project that has a series of milestones that are funded for a time and then eventually kind of go away. That's the common enterprise IT model. Less so with the software as a service, but sometimes that, that idea comes into to play as well. The idea that, well, I just need enough money to get this API out the door, and once it's done, it's done. Some organizations will think about APIs as just the technical side of things. Oh, that's what the, the IT people think about. That's what the software developers think about. That's no different than picking a, a, a web framework or a cloud technology or set of resources or framework or something else that, that we have out there. But really when we think about APIs as products, it's about putting 
First off, product thinking into the design, as I mentioned before, the jobs to be done, those outcomes. And it's also to think about the API product as something that's going to live for a long time. When we think about a product, we don't just want to use a, a particular product and, and never have support for it. You know, we just, we get it, we install it and, or, or we start using it in some way. But if we get stuck, we have no one to turn to. Uh, we do see that sometimes even in the software as a service model. But the ones that really elevate to the top, you know, they really elevated their game and they're really uh, supporting the customer, see the customer as a first class citizen, sees them as someone that will need support, that the product should improve over time. So that's much different than a project oriented approach that we see in enterprise IT. It requires us then to shift our thinking on APIs from just something that's a technology bolt on solution or you know, just relegated to to the engineers that know how to speak HTTP and, you know, uh, how to write the code necessary to implement the API, but rather to putting product ownership in there and stewarding that API, growing it, maturing it, delivering it, listening to our customers that are using it, our customers being developers, maybe end users that are ultimately consuming that API through some sort of, you know, web, mobile experience, voice experience, whatever it is. And, and thinking about what we have uh, delivered already, what we can do to improve it and to continually refine and make improvements. And that's a much different perspective for a lot to take on, particularly with an API, because, you know, the API doesn't necessarily have a front end interface of its own. It's going to be consumed by developers that'll put a front end interface to it to deliver that complete experience. But there's, there's more to it than that. So we have to kind of step back and think about it uh, from a life cycle perspective and extend that life cycle beyond just the delivery of the initial API. But what's the next, you know, 1.1, 1 1.2? 1 how are we going to make this better? How are we going to improve the experience of the developers using this? How are we going to solve more problems with this? How can we uh, address more uh, or deliver better outcomes than we did before and to continue to refine and improve that? I wonder too, if taking a product approach, you ever yourself or work with some sort of a literally product team to try to monetize the APIs. Some APIs are just a consequence of, of what you have to provide. And perhaps there's no way to monetize that itself. But I think that others have that opportunity. Do you broach that at all in your business? Uh, we, we are often in discussions with organizations about this, um, and, and there's, there's a few factors at play. One, do they have an audience that would see value sufficient enough to pay explicitly for that API? Most organizations, their products are not their APIs, but they want APIs to automate their product offerings or their digital capabilities that they deliver to the marketplace. So in that case, the monetization tends to be more indirect. What they're really striving to do is either to meet the needs of the marketplace, either as an industry leader or a fast follower in an industry that's starting to drive toward automation. And so they need that API to deliver that and it becomes table stakes for them. For others, they may see this as an opportunity to reduce their customer churn. So from an API perspective, we see that the deeper your integration is with another organization, the more expensive it's going to be for you to reverse that integration and go to a competitor and, and decide to, to uproot and leave that relationship and engage in another business relationship and then integrate and automate with them. The work is just oftentimes too burdensome, too costly. So getting an integration established between organizations is really paramount to reduce that churn, to deepen that relationship with that partner ecosystem. It's fairly rare to have a set of customers that are going to pay individually to automate because we know most end users probably are not going to want to integrate with the API. They just want to pull out a, a phone or a tablet or, or their laptop or something and integrate, you know, to, to, to interact with that organization specifically. I have, however, seen a lot more discussion lately on chargebacks within an organization. So a particular organization stands up an API and it's delivering value that can be realized across the organization. However, the cost of maintaining that infrastructure, maintaining that development staff to keep that API up and running, supported, and properly scaled to address the request level, you know, the number of requests per second or per day or whatever metric that is, uh, to, to support that traffic throughout the day and throughout the month 
sometimes requires a chargeback. So organizations are getting a little bit more creative to start drawing funds from other parts of the organization to support their efforts of very high value APIs that are that can be leveraged across the org and aren't specific to a particular digital channel. So we are seeing that as well. So there's organizations exploring that piece, but it, it's rare for at least the organizations that I worked with where we have an enterprise IT side of things where we're actually monetizing the API itself. It's usually indirect or, or it plays a role in, in revenue generated. So there's a metric of, you know, some number of API requests will result in some amount of revenue generation or we've generated x amount of revenue through the apis because of xyz digital channels web mobile partnerships and so on so if if uh, your program sponsor is not your cfo maybe you need to look into how we gain back some revenues even within the organization it, it makes a lot of sense that way your support is less so a cost center or clearly justifiable by means of the income that or revenues that you generate even internally. It's interesting. Okay. So now we've gotten this uh, background on the work that you do now. When I approached you and said, James, how would you like to write a book on APIs in my signature series? And I, I don't recall exactly how long it took, but it didn't take very long. And I saw yes in reply. So, and that, that's because, you know, we, we had established, um, at least a, a decent relationship some years ago. I, I was up in Colorado for visiting, you know, our old digs up there and dropped by Colorado Springs. And, and I was pretty excited that you had relocated there from, I think, Austin. So we got to meet. And so we're, we're familiar with each other's work. So I guess maybe that had something to do with it, that we had, you know, done a little bit of knowledge transfer before, but I always thought you should have a book on this subject and here we are. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I appreciate the offer and the opportunity to be able to be part of your signature series. Um, it's, it's very exciting. It didn't, it definitely didn't take me long at all to say yes. Uh, it, it probably took me a little bit longer to think about, I started out immediately thinking about what should be in the book. I think before I even wrote a reply, because I, I had actually self-published a book with one of my other uh, writing partners, uh, Keith Casey. He and I put together a self-published book. We used that to drive a lot of our original training. And so I had some thoughts about what this should look like and had actually put together a, an API design process that had been delivered for a number of organizations around the world. So when I started thinking about what this should look like, I started thinking about, well, what is the one book that if I were... Uh, it, me as an API consultant wanted to walk into an engagement with and know that I had by my side for reference and to be able to point other people to, what would that look like? And that's what I started thinking about when we put together this book. So, so we started thinking about what, what is it that, you know, that, that this audience really needs. And the one thing that I've constantly stumbled into, whether you're a developer and in an architect role, maybe you're a tech lead, maybe you're a product owner, product manager, and you've been assigned this ownership of an API and you don't know quite how to get started. That's who I wanted to write this for. How do you approach this from a stepwise process to go from uh, the idea that we need an API or the initiative going on within an organization that we have an API program that either exists today and we're really going to you know, start to mature and grow this, or we need one and we don't have one yet. How do we get started? And, and a lot of it really focuses on the design. There's, there's a lot of other work that, that in my engagements come before and after this book. But I think from a practical perspective, every organization has probably already identified at least one API they need to deliver. And, and the question becomes, how do we approach designing this API so that it has a great developer experience? So, so that's why I wrote this book, The Principles of Web API Design. I was excited to find out that your book entered the Rough Cuts availability on the O'Reilly platform, O'Reilly eLearning, I think they call it. And uh, that's a big step in itself. This means, you know, the book is in really good shape. Rough Cuts, it's sort of funny. I've, I've seen some really Rough Cuts books, and this is not one of them, in my opinion. This is just lacking a little cleanup before, you know, being actually printed. So that's that's excellent. So I, I think people can get a really good idea of what you're talking about just by going to Safari right now. Of course, it'll be available there, 
the O'Reilly e-learning platform, but um, it will be there in fully published form, but it's a great place to go and, and find out right now, you know, what is this book about? What does it offer me? Could you explain just a little bit about the ADDR approach that you use and you talk about in the book, maybe not extensively, but just in general, and how does that fit in with agile as in agility, not not necessarily ceremony, but how does that work out? Yeah, definitely. So the the full title of the book, just to kind of set the context, is Principles of Web API Design Delivering Value with APIs and Microservices. And so part of the, the positioning that I have in this book is that APIs are, are meant to deliver value. And so how do we discover that value? Uh, the ADDR process stands for Align, Define, Design, and Refine. It's four phases that you go through as you're designing a web API. And uh, oftentimes, developers that architects that have been working with web APIs for years, they're probably already going through these phases. They just haven't maybe given a label to it or thought consciously about how they've transitioned through them. So the book is laid out in that way. It proposes the fact that if we have a repeatable process for a web API design, one that's lightweight, that gives you rapid feedback, we can discover what we need and deliver it without having to make these last minute can, you know, massive uh, recoding efforts when we start discovering that things aren't going our way. One of the biggest things that I've seen with web API design is that, uh, well, oftentimes as developers drop into our IDE and go, I know exactly what I need. And I'm going to start writing code because the data is already in the database. And I've written this SQL outer join query a hundred times for different reasons. And I know that if I just build an API that leverages that outer join and pulls the data in and structures it in JSON, everyone's going to love my API and use it. But we sometimes get so caught up in all the implementation details and all the specific things that we know we need to build in code that we forget to take that step back and look at those outcomes. So the ADDR process really starts with a line, aligning ourselves to what the outcomes are. What are the jobs to be done? Are we going to end up implementing an API that is going to solve someone's problems? Or are we simply just taking something that we've already done that, that's implementation specific and we're just trying to make that happen over HTTP? And oftentimes what I see, and I've, I've experienced this firsthand, and that's why this process evolved into what it is today. We start off with this idea of what we think we need. And then we miss an opportunity to sit down with stakeholders from the business side, from the product side. If you have a software as a service offering, sitting down with your product owners, your product managers, and really understanding what is needed. So before we launch into code, it's important to align ourselves to make sure that all of our outcomes are headed in, you know, that we're focused on the same outcomes and we're all headed in the same direction. So that's the align phase. And we, we look at different steps on how to do that from aligning on the jobs to be done and then doing some activity decomposition to really understand the steps that are required to get there. Once we're all aligned and on the same page, the first D in ADDR is define. So we take that alignment understanding and start to now define what does the API need to do? What operations does it need to support? And those of you that practice REST APIs, you may be thinking about URLs, URIs, the path structures, the HTTP methods, the, the gets, the posts, and all that. For GraphQL, uh, designers, we might be thinking more along schema and mutations. And for gRPC, we're just thinking, what are the uh, procedures that we're going to externalize over the network? But before we do any of that, what we want to do is take that job, take those activities that help to produce those outcomes and start to map those out. And we map them out by identifying the operations in a protocol agnostic way. Before we get to REST, before we get to GraphQL, gRPC, whatever it is, what, what does the API need to do? And then kind of where are our boundaries how many APIs do we are really talking about here? How are we going to separate this out? Is it one big API? Is it a number of smaller APIs that each have a few operations and so on? And we start to define what that looks like. And it, is, it helps to paint, uh, you know, a picture. It gives us a sketch of what we need to deliver. Once we know what we're going to be bringing to the solution from the definition side, we then start the design side. And that's where we pick our API styles, REST, 
GraphQL, gRPC, and we take that definition that we previously composed and then we migrate that and apply that to our API styles. What you'll notice about this process is it's, it's very rapid, very quick, but it ensures that communication is occurring all along the way, which is core to their principles of agility. The Agile Manifesto and the principles that came from that uh, assert that we need to have frequent communication and feedback cycles. And so we're working through the API design by having feedback cycles at the beginning rather than the end so that we don't waste a lot of time building code that we don't want. And part of that is the API design style. Will REST be the right fit for our target audience? Well, if we haven't aligned on what outcomes we're trying to produce and what those digital channels are, and we haven't defined what the API needs to offer in terms of operations to get there, then it makes it really hard for us to pick an API style. So we're going to be subjectively picking what we know the most rather than what's the best fit for the target developers. Is GraphQL the right fit? Is it gRPC? Is it is it REST? Is it something else that's emerging? We even in the book talk about async API styles, so webhooks and web sockets and you know different styles of eventing and messaging and streaming and so on. So there's different interaction styles, and we need to align and define what we need first before we're really ready to commit to one or more API design styles. We then use the R, the refine phase, to go back and revisit our design, to gather feedback, to create mocks of our design with different tools to start kind of the early documentation effort so we can get feedback. It's all about communication. This prevents a common problem from emerging where the API team is always blocking the rest of the organization from moving forward. The front end developers can't do anything till the API has been you know, designed and implemented and they can start calling it and so on and so forth. So if we start with the design first and then we can deliver some mock implementations of our design before we actually do all the heavy lifting of tying it into back end systems and dealing with error cases and edge cases and everything else that are going to come up, let's design what the API needs to do based on the definition of the API that, that we've, we've done in a protocol agnostic way based on aligning with all of our stakeholders. So we align, define, design, and then we refine by building a mock or something else that allows front-end developers to start integrating with a, a mock implementation of our design uh, that allows people to give us feedback early rather than late as to whether our web API design is going to support the needs that we've previously identified. Have we hit the mark or missed the mark in some areas? And, and then we can, we can start to code. Now, we can code along the way. There's nothing that says we can't. But we want to limit that blast radius if somebody comes along during the refine phase and says, you know what, we talked about all these things, but now that I see your design in a mock and I'm trying to tie it into my mobile app, my web app, some automation script that's you know combining with other third-party APIs to deliver some sort of really great business value for a partner or something. Before we get to the point where we've written all that code, let's identify where we've gone wrong, where our assumptions are misaligned in some ways, and let's go back and revisit that. And, and let's deliver an API that works well and it's very thoughtful and is very outside in uh, purpose so that we're delivering solutions or outcomes rather than just starting with our databases and starting to build APIs based on our database that that were meant for maybe a different purpose or or made some optimizations to achieve certain IOPS you know requirements certain queries per second or write you know, rights per second and so on and so forth. Let's let's step out and figure out what the business needs are and align on that first. So that's what we cover in the book. We start off talking about how to align and what techniques do we use for that, how to define an API in a protocol agnostic way, then apply the right style, then refine it. And then once we have that done, you can go off and build and apply whatever principles, frameworks, methodologies you find are the best fit for you and your organization. What I take out of this, I mean, really salient points is just because you know how to write the outer join doesn't mean you get to make a decision for the whole program of, you know, a hundred million dollar investment or something to decide this is the API that everybody's going to get. So you have to engage with the business. And this actually, you know, talk about aligning, this aligns very well with domain-driven design. And I know that that's part of your process is to include domain-driven design in that. And then hopefully no one's getting the idea, well, this sounds like big upfront design where we're going to do a bunch of work before anyone gets to use anything because I'm assuming that this 
design and refine come very quickly and then refining happens with a purpose. Can, can you just talk about the time frame and show why this is not waterfall? So here's the problem that, and I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit for this. I think we've, we failed to leverage some of the learnings we've had over the years when we've gone down this path of agile software processes. When we think about agile processes, it means constant communication, but it doesn't necessarily mean cowboy coding or just jump right into the code and, and the ID is the only thing that matters. Uh, there's been this misconception, I think, over the years that we don't need to plan. And, and so the ADR process is designed to work really well in an agile environment. Because what it does is it's based upon those agile principles, those agile fundamental principles of constant communication and constantly delivering value. When we look at the align and the define phases, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to make sure that what we code up is going to deliver value. If you have another process that does that, great, leverage that. But I've seen a lot of organizations struggle because they've veered so far away from the fear of getting into a waterfall process that they're not willing to apply a little bit of discipline. And it shows in their web API designs. Because we have to remember that web APIs are forever. Once someone starts integrating with it, it is very, very hard to get someone to move. And the only way to move to some breaking change, to some new version of the API, is either to force it by breaking it and their systems are completely non-functional until they adapt to your change, which is what I lovingly call the Facebook model, because you'd go to sleep knowing that your system was running great and wake up and they introduced a breaking change, but they notified no one until it was changed. Like, oh, guess what? This API changed and we broke something and now you have to adapt to it. And meanwhile, your site is down. That was their approach uh, over a decade ago, and it had hurt a lot of organizations for doing that. So do we want that in our enterprise? We don't. We also have had a, a decline in documentation, and everybody says code is documentation. Uh, and I would say, yes, it documents what, what's supposed to happen, but not why. And, and when we think about web APIs, most people, most developers consuming a, a web API are not going to have access to the source code. Because unless you're working on an open source solution or unless you're inside the organization where the code exists, no one's ever going to be able to look at your code and try to understand how it works. So we have to have a bit of a discipline when it comes to web API design to make sure that we, one, are thoughtful about how it's designed so that it can solve problems. And that means we apply our agile principles of having constant communication and feedback so we can constantly deliver value. So when in the align and define stages, we're looking kind of at the big picture, making sure we all understand what we're trying to deliver so that we don't waste our time writing code that gets thrown away. And then we have to, at the last minute, incur a bunch of technical debt because we're trying to make a lot of last minute changes to accommodate things that we misunderstood that could have been solved by a little bit of communication up front. We also can recognize that you don't have to boil the ocean. Uh, the ADR process can be used in an iterative fashion. So we can take a look at some scope, align, define, design, and refine our API to meet that scope, and then come back and start to add to it and enhance it over time. So let's get a, a common understanding. Let's deliver a portion of the API. Let's get feedback. Let's make sure we're delivering value. And then let's go through the process again. So it very much is aligned with uh, an agile delivery, but I think everyone's definition of agile has taken on a bit of a different meaning. So it's really designed to meet that organization's agile principles where we're delivering value and where it, it, we want a process that's lightweight, that can accommodate big or small initiatives, and that can encourage uh, an outcome-based approach with uh, communication along the way so that our APIs really hit the mark and we're not going back and having to redo things at the last minute. I'm glad you got on your soapbox. If there's room, I'll step up there with you. <laughs> uh, well, think about it, right? Whether it's 12 teams or 2,500 teams, try to scale with ad hoc default design, which happens just as you say, because some developer has uh, an IDE and some plugins to make this you know, new API really convenient to generate and release and everybody's going to love it except for as soon as they add one parameter to something right how many dependencies are there on that and i guess that introduces to um governance so could you just talk about how we deal with this grand i mean really 12 teams is still a lot when you think about 
the size of the organization that has those 12 teams. I mean, we're probably talking of, I don't know, maybe a 500 or a thousand person company like that. Maybe not even quite that big. 2,500 teams. That's enormous, right? So where does governance come in there? One of the things that I teach people is that if you are offering an API externally, you have a developer portal for a SaaS product, for your enterprise. That portal tells a lot about how, one, how much you value developers and their time because the quality of documentation will determine how fast or how slow it is to figure out how to use your API. And two, it represents what your organization does or how you see yourself as in the marketplace for the digital capabilities that you bring to bear. Now, expanding on that idea, when I look at an API, particularly, let's say, a, an enterprise API that spans multiple teams, or perhaps it's a software as a service, and they have multiple development teams, and each development team is designed and built an API for their particular area, I can determine very quickly how much they value the developer's time because I want to see what their error messages are that they return. What's the structure of the error message across every operation that they offer? Is it the same or is it different? Uh, going a step further, is their naming the same or different? Are they calling the same things the same thing? Are they using the same terminology, same vocabulary? As we know in domain-driven design terms, the ubiquitous language of that domain should be apparent at the API level as well. You know, when I'm using that API and I'm in this particular role, either either as a consumer or a partner, I'm going to expect to see terms that I know so that I can understand how to use your API effectively. If you've named things inconsistently or if you've even just dropped between camel case and snake case in your field names, anything as simple as that will tell me how much you value my time as a developer that's responsible for integrating your API to help me produce solutions. And so governance while it takes on kind of a cringy feeling and, and some people end up being triggered by it because of the software as a service, I mean, sorry, as the, the service oriented architecture days, the SOA days, if they're triggered because of the SOA days of governance, uh, we may have then decided as an organization to kind of veer the other direction and swing the pendulum completely in the other direction. We say, you know what? We don't need governance. Every team can do what they want, except that they're not factoring in the developer experience of the, the poor developer who's told, hey, we just signed a deal with this, with this organization. We're in a partnership and we need to integrate with them and they have this API and here's their portal or here's their PDF docs with how to use the API. And they're impossible to follow and they're outdated and nothing works right. And every time I need to recover from, you know, do error handling logic in my code, I have to handle it a different way every time I use a different operation from their API. So all that to say that that, that having a bit of standards and, and governance is important. So part of what we do as LaunchInny is we work with organizations to help them do that in a lightweight fashion. And so we do that by looking at a number of different processes and, and elements. We call it the API compass. It's, it's eight different disciplines. If you imagine in your mind a, a compass with eight compass points from north to northeast to east and so on all the way around. There's eight particular areas that we need to make sure we're unified on with our API program so that not only our API design delivers value, but the APIs themselves in the program are sustainable and offer a great support system for developers that are working with your APIs. So it starts with strategy and culture and, uh, you know, are we aligned there to processes and governance and, you know, having a lightweight style guide that says, here's how we're going to approach things. If we use these patterns and practices, every developer that uses any API API across the organization, whether we're 12 teams or 2,500 teams, can have the same experience. We'll expect the same error payload, can write error handling code the same way and repeatedly as they integrate with more and more APIs. That requires us to kind of look at our portfolio and products. That's the third discipline. What are the what are we you know managing and, and exposing and, and how are we managing the surface area of our API? And do all of our designs you know follow the 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 processes and the governance that we design them in a similar way. And then can we find them through discovery and documentation? Can I have an easy time onboarding with them and getting started with it? Or am I going to be struggling and, and just wishing I hadn't even been assigned this task? And then the sixth one is design and delivery. And that's really where the book fits in. It gives you a process by which to think about how to repeatedly deliver consistent designs across APIs and deliver them uh, repeatedly across the organization. 
and then management and analytics and security and operations are the last two. So you look at it holistically and think, you know, there's there is a bigger picture to our API programs and and the governance, whether it's a center of excellence, a center for enablement, an API guild, some sort of API program that's formalized in a way that that helps us to drive toward a standard design uh, while giving teams and empowering teams to deviate where it makes sense so that the developer experience is the best possible. And then looking at that holistically across the API program is really, really important. So we work with a lot of organizations when we do that. Uh, there, there's some guidance in the book about kind of how to get started a little bit with that, how to, what to think about with design reviews and enforcing style guides. And do I do it in a centralized way or do I federate it out? Because I have so many teams, I can't have a small group of three or four people approving every API that gets designed and needs to be delivered. So how do we think about taking the ADDR process and kind of scaling it up and then encouraging consistency of design, deviating where necessary, and encouraging organization to become one that discovers first and develops second. Can we leverage what we've already built? Can we leverage the hard work of others first and do it in a consistent and easy and approachable way? Uh, or are we going to have to just everyone is forced to start over and rebuild the same thing over and over again? And that's really what a lot of organizations are trying to get out of it. So having just some lightweight governance in there will go a really long way. So we're really excited to have you kind of join the Kaleli team in terms of having a, a training workshop available through us. And the theme of the workshop is collaborative web API design, which I think embodies much of what you've been talking about. Can, can you tell potential students what to expect? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited as well and, and appreciate the opportunity to be able to partner with you on this. So um, over the years, I've delivered a lot of private workshops. They've been anywhere between one and five days, depending on, you know, the topics that we had covered and the emphasis that different uh, organizations wanted to place on the training. They may have particular areas they feel like they have weak spots on and whatnot. And so I've been delivering this this course for at least eight years, maybe longer. Uh, and it's it's been delivered to thousands and thousands of people all around the world from, from South Korea to uh, Switzerland, to the UK, to the Netherlands and, and US and Canada. And I'm really excited to be able to offer this publicly now for the first time as an opportunity to spend three half day sessions digging into this aligned, defined, design, refined process that ADDR process. So what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about the process as a whole, and then we're going to dive in and we're going to get hands-on. It's a little bit of lecture, a little bit of hands-on. Uh, it's remotely delivered here for all of us. Um, it's in a time frame where uh, I hope can accommodate those in Europe as well as in the U.S. And what we want to do is we want to go through uh, the seven steps that make up this, this ADDR process. So we have the four phases and there's these different steps along the way. We're going to explore job stories and how to think outside in and find those outcomes and then break those down into the individual steps that are required to realize those outcomes and then start to find API boundaries and model our API into a definition that represents what we need to deliver to the marketplace. And then we're going to look at REST-based APIs in this session, but we may have some follow-on sessions as well, depending on the demand. So if, if you're more of a GraphQL person or a gRPC person and you want to learn about how to apply it to that, then let us know and we'll find ways to get that in there as well. And so we'll we'll look at how do we go from the job stories and the activity steps and finding our boundaries and identifying where APIs are at to modeling them and designing them and refining them and even documenting them. So it's a lot of content compacted into three half day sessions. And uh, we may end up doing a little bit of take home homework just to kind of fill in because there's a lot to get done. Uh, but by the end of it, you will have experienced the principles of web API design book hands-on with me, understanding how we put this into practice. And, and you'll get a chance to see what does that look like uh, and how have I been teaching other organizations around the world on how to apply the same process, whether they're just a few teams building APIs in parallel, or there are a lot of teams, you know, up to that 2,500 uh, team scale that I talked about one of my clients uh, is at. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get hands-on. It's going to be a little lecture, a lot of hands-on. It's not going to be any coding. I want to make sure that that's pretty clear. So you don't have to worry about, do I know Java? Is it going to be Python? Is it going to be C sharp? We take it to the HTTP level. 
And by the time you're done, you're gonna have a high level design that then you would take and bring in whatever platforms, frameworks, languages, everything that you're delivering for. So uh, I know you, you've you got the Vlingo framework, we have Spring Boot, we have Node Express and a number of variants off of, of Node. We have Python and you know different things like Django and other frameworks. So whatever it is, uh, you'll get benefit from this. It's not just for any one programming language. Uh, and it's, it's gonna help you understand how to get there and how to get there quickly. And you're gonna be better equipped to be able to apply this. You're gonna be ahead of the curve because you're gonna be able to dive in and learn about this before the book's even released. And uh, you're gonna be one of the thousands that have learned how to do this, but for the first time do it you know, in a public setting where we get to work together on this rather than in a corporate setting where you have to be one of my clients to be able to take advantage of this training. So I'm really excited to be able to deliver it and it's coming up pretty quick. So we're putting just the finishing touches on what this is gonna going to look like customized for this particular group. And uh, we're going to dive in and, and, and really just from the start, get, get started pretty quick. That um, sounds really good. I think it's going to be a big benefit to those who, you know, of course, we can't be in uh, most cases in close contact these days uh, for on site, but it's the the best that we can do at this time. And I think it's a great opportunity to learn. I know that there are uh, some from Europe and the UK and uh, the US already registered for it and we're ready to roll. Uh, I think it's just a few weeks away. So we look forward to it. And James, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been a really good conversation and I think it's a opportunity for people to learn how to approach API design, web API design. So I think this will be one of our most popular podcasts. I appreciate it, Vaughn. Thanks for the opportunity.